نحن كلنا على خطر نسهة المؤمن الفكر لذة المؤمن العبر نحمد الله وحده نحن كلنا على خطر رب لاه عمره قد تقطع ما شعر رب لاه عمره قد تقطع ما شعر رب عيش قد كان فوق المنام لق الزهر رب عيش قد كان فوق إن الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلله فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن إلا وأنتم مسلمون يا أيها الناس اتقوا ربكم الذي خلقكم من نفس واحدة وخلق منها زوجها وبث منهما رجالا كثيرا ونساء واتقوا الله الذي تساءلون به والأرحام إن الله كان عليكم رقيبا يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله وقولوا قولا سديدا يصلح لكم أعمالكم ويغفر لكم ذنوبكم ومن يطع الله ورسوله فقد فاز فوزا عظيما أما بعد فإن أصدق الحديث كتاب الله وخير الهدي هدي محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وشر الأمور محدثاتها وكل محدثة بدعة وكل بدعة ضلالة وكل ضلالة في النار All praise is due to Allah Azza wa Jal who has praised knowledge and raised the status of its people as Allah says in the Quran, يَرْفَعِ اللَّهُ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا مِنْكُمْ وَالَّذِينَ أُوتُوا الْعِلْمَ دَرَجَاتِ Allah Azza wa Jal will raise the status of those who have iman and those who have knowledge amongst you. It is through knowledge that the superiority of Adam alayhi salam, our father, was shown over the, the angels. As Allah Azza wa Jal says, وَعَلَّمَ آدَمَ الْأَسْمَاءَ كُلَّهَا Allah taught Adam the names of all things. It was through knowledge that the status of our own Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was established. As Allah azza wa jal states, وَأَنزَلَ اللَّهُ عَلَيْكَ الْكِتَابَ وَالْحِكْمَةَ وَعَلَّمَكَ مَا لَمْ تَكُنْ تَعْلَمْ وَكَانَ فَضْلُ اللَّهِ عَلَيْكَ عَظِيمًا That Allah azza wa jal has revealed to you the book and the wisdom, meaning the Quran and the Sunnah, and He taught you that which you do not know. وَعَلَّمَكَ مَا لَمْ تَكُنْ تَعْلَمْ And because of this, وَكَانَ فَضْلُ اللَّهِ عَلَيْكَ عَظِيمًا that the, benefit, that the blessings of Allah over you were very great and very superior. It is so great, the status of knowledge, that Allah Azza wa Jal testifies on their behalf. As Allah says, شَهِدَ اللَّهُ أَنَّهُ لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا هُوَ وَالْمَلَائِكَةُ وَأُولُو الْعِلْمِ قَائِمًا بالقسط. Allah Azza wa Jal witnesses, testifies, shahida that there is no object worthy of worship except himself. And the angels testify to this as well, and the people of knowledge standing with justice. And this verse is the greatest verse praising the people of knowledge. Because Allah Azza wa Jal testifies for them without them having to say anything. And when Allah Azza wa Jal testifies for them, what does this show you about them? And he testifies for them regarding the most important kalima, La ilaha illallah. And he describes them as standing with justice. So Allah Azza wa Jal began with himself that Allah testifies. And then he said the angels testify. And then he followed that up with the people of knowledge. They also testify. And this is enough of a tazkiyah, enough of a means of purifying and showing the status of the people of knowledge. It is the people of knowledge who truly understand the Qur'an. As Allah says, وَتِلْكَ الْأَمْثَالُ نَضْرِبُهَا لِلنَّاسِ وَمَا يَعْقِلُهَا إِلَّا الْعَالِمُونَ These are the parables that we give to people, but nobody understands them except the people of knowledge. It is the people of knowledge who truly fear Allah Azza wa Jal. And no one can fear Allah and have the true taqwa of Allah except for the alim. As Allah says in the Qur'an, إِنَّمَا يَخْشَ اللَّهَ مِنْ عِبَادِهِ الْعُلَمَاءِ That the only people who truly fear Allah are the ulama. Therefore, it comes as no surprise that this is the only subject, this is the only matter 
that the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam has been commanded to ask Allah to increase him in. وَقُلْ رَبِّ زِدْنِي عِلْمَ وَقُلْ رَبِّ زِدْنِي عِلْمَ Oh my, and say, O oh Muhammad, and say, O oh my Lord, increase me in ilm. Knowledge is a sign, it is an indication that Allah Azza wa Jal is pleased with a person. مَنْ يُرِدِ اللَّهُ بِهِ خَيْرًا يُفَقِّهُ فِي الدِّينِ Whoever Allah wishes good for, He gives him an understanding of the deen. The ulama are the inheritors of the prophets because they collectively take on the status of the prophets. It is the prophets who tell the people what to do, when to do it, and how to do it. But we will not have any more prophet. So who will take on the status? Even though they cannot take on the blessings and they cannot take on the responsibility, but there will be a collective group of people who will take on the status of guiding the ummah. And it is the ulama who take on this status. As the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, that in al ulama awaratatul anbiya, that the ulama are the inheritors of the prophets. And in one long hadith he stated, in Sunan al-Tirmidhi as is narrated, that whoever takes a path seeking knowledge through it, one thing, he travels to the earth. Whether it be a long distance or a small distance, it doesn't matter. If you leave your house wanting to learn some knowledge, then... مَنْ سَلَكَ طَرِيقًا يَلْتَمِسُ بِهِ عِلْمًا سَهَّلَ اللَّهُ بِهِ طَرِيقًا إِلَى جَنَّةً Allah will make the path to Jannah easy for him. And then he said that the malaika come down and they lower their wings upon the student of knowledge, طالب العلم, out of happiness, out of pleasure for what he is doing. And the ulama, the scholars state that the meaning of this is that the angels are flying around looking for good people. When they find the student of knowledge, they stop flying and they accompany him. And they lower their wings of mercy over him. And they wish to benefit from him. So that is why they stay with him. Because the very, the, the very presence of the angels is a blessing. When the angels are there, Allah's sakina and Allah's rahmah comes down. So when they find the student of knowledge, the Prophet ﷺ said that they lower their wings. Meaning that they stop flying and they accompany the student of knowledge out of pleasure for what he seeks. And then the Prophet ﷺ said that every single object, in the heavens and in the earth. Even the ant in its ant hole and the fish in the sea, they pray to Allah to bless the one who teaches mankind good. And then he said, and this is all one hadith, all of it is the same hadith. And then he said that the blessings and the superiority of the alim over the abid, the superiority of the alim over the worshiper is like the superiority of the full moon over the stars. The full moon, look at it, over one of the stars. This is the superiority that an alim has over the worshipper. And the reason for this is that the worshipper, the one who fasts and prays and gives zakah and this and that, he only benefits himself. But it is the alim that he teaches mankind good and he benefits an entire ummah through his knowledge. Therefore, his superiority is like the moon. Do you know a full moon is so bright that you can see in the middle of the night with the full moon? It is that bright. Yet all the stars combined... They cannot show you any light. So the alim shows his light to the people and he benefits the people in this way. But the abid, the worshipper, he does not show light to anyone. He only benefits himself. And then the Prophet ﷺ went on and he said that the ulama are the inheritors of the prophets. The ulama are the inheritors of the prophets. For the prophets did not leave behind gold and silver to be inherited. Rather they left behind knowledge. So whoever has taken this knowledge has taken a very large quantity of good. This is the ulama, they take on the status, meaning that they guide the ummah, they tell them what to do, when to do and how to do it. So therefore they are the inheritors of the prophets. And when you are inheriting from the Prophet wasallam, then who will be richer than you? Who will be richer than you when you inherit directly from the Prophet wasallam? But realize, brothers and sisters, that the knowledge that is praised in the Qur'an and Sunnah is the knowledge of Islam. It is the knowledge of Islam, of Sharia, of Aqeedah, of Tawheed, of Fiqh, primarily. And this is because the Prophet wasallam stated, مَنْ يُرِدِ اللَّهُ بِهِ خَيْرًا يُفَقِّهُ فِي الدِّينِ Whoever Allah wishes good for, He gives him a knowledge of the deen, an understanding of this religion. And in another authentic hadith, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said that inna Allah ta'ala yubghidu kulla alimin bid dunya jahilin bil akhira. Allah azza wa jal hates every person who is knowledgeable of this world but ignorant of the hereafter. Therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, 
it behooves us to start learning our religion, to start studying these sciences of Islam, that every one of us should go out of his way, should take a path, traverse on a journey, even if it's from his house to the masjid, whatever the journey might be, to make it a regular habit, to be with the people of knowledge, to increase in your knowledge, to read the books of the people of knowledge, to listen to the cassettes of the people of knowledge, in order that we ourselves can obtain the blessings that are mentioned in this hadith. And without a doubt, the greatest knowledge and the most noble of all sciences is the knowledge of Allah Azza wa Jal and His rights upon us and His names and attributes. It is the knowledge of Tawheed. As Allah Azza wa Jal describes in the Quran, وَكَذَلِكَ أَوْحَيْنَا إِلَيْكَ رُوحًا مِّنْ أَمْرِنَا This is how we have inspired you with a spirit from us. Allah describes the Quran as a spirit because this is the, the book that brings the knowledge of who Allah is. It brings the knowledge of what Allah wants us to do. It brings the knowledge of His names and attributes. Therefore, it is the spirit, it is the life that we need. Without this knowledge, we are dead. Without this knowledge, we do not have a spiritual life, even if we eat and drink and are walking on the face of this earth. Spiritually, if we do not have this knowledge, we are dead. As Allah says, this is how we have inspired you with a spirit from us. You did not know what the book was. You did not know iman, you did not know what the book was. But we have made it a light, a shining light for you. And by this light, we guide whom we will. So Allah has called this knowledge has called the Qur'an which brings this knowledge, the life. And he has called it the light. So this knowledge is the light that guides us from the darkness of shirk, the darkness of kufr, the darkness of our desires to the light of the worship of Allah. This knowledge is the life that brings us the real spiritual life, such that even if our bodies die, if our souls are alive, we will have an eternal life in the hereafter. If our souls are alive with the life of Islam, the life of Iman, the life of Tawheed. In another verse, Allah Azza wa Jal says, Awaman kana maytan fa Give the example of the one who was dead and we rose him back. We gave him life, we resurrected him. The analogy here is not to the one who was physically dead and then he was resurrected from the grave. No. What is being referred to is the one who was spiritually dead who did not believe in Allah, who did not worship Allah. فَأَحْيَيْنَاهُ We gave him life by guiding him to Islam, by guiding him to the worship of Allah. أَوَمَنْ كَانَ مَيْتًا فَأَحْيَيْنَاهُ وَجَعَلْنَا لَهُ نُورًا يَمْشِي بِهِ فِي النَّاسِ And we gave him a light, the light of Iman, the light of knowledge. And he walks amongst people with this light. كَمَا مَثَلُهُ فِي الظُّلُمَاتِ لَيْسَ بِخَارِجِ مِنْهَا Is his example the same as the one who is in the darkness, never going to leave it? The one who has Iman, the one who has knowledge, the one who has the life of Islam, is he equivalent to the one who is in the darkness wandering around? The one who is in the, in the dark will never find his way out, will never know how to get from one place to the other. So he is wandering in circles aimlessly. And this is exactly what the kuffar do, those that don't have the life in their hearts. They do not have a purpose, they do not have a goal in life. They eat and they drink and they are merry just like the animals are as Allah says in the Quran. So they wander around aimlessly in their desires, never having a final goal. Is he equivalent, this kafir, to the one who has the final goal? He has the light to guide him and he has the life by which he can use this light. Wallahi, they are not the same. They are not the same as Allah Azza wa Jal Himself says. So my dear brothers and sisters, with this brief introduction about the blessings of knowledge and in particular the blessings of Tawheed and of Iman, we now embark on a series of small journeys, if you like, in our path to study this knowledge. The knowledge of Tawheed, the knowledge of Aqeedah, the knowledge of our kalima, La ilaha illallah, Muhammadur Rasulullah. And what does it mean? What are the implications of this kalima? As we know, this kalima is called the kalima to Tawheed. So what exactly is Tawheed? We have to define Tawheed before we start talking about the kalima. Tawheed is from the root wahada, which means to ascribe unity to something. Wahada means he ascribed unity to something. He, thought, he, he made something into one. And when applied in Islamic sciences, it means to unify Allah Azza wa Jal in His Lordship and in His names and attributes and in His rights to be worshipped. These three aspects. The unity of Allah Azza wa Jal 
in his lordship and in his names and attributes and of his rights to be worshipped. And this tripartite division, meaning the three divisions of Tawheed, are clearly found in the Quran and in the Sunnah. In fact, when we open up the Quran, Surah Al-Fatiha, it gives us these three types of Tawheed. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen, Tawheed al rububiyyah we call it. Allah is the Lord of the worlds. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen, Allah is praising Himself because He is the only Rabb, the Lord of the worlds. Ar-Rahman ar rahimi Maliki Yawm din He is describing Himself. Who is He? The Tawheed of His names and attributes. Iyaka na'budu wa iyaka nasta'in. You alone do we worship and you alone are the one whose help we seek. This is the Tawheed of worship. So within these first three, four verses of the Qur'an, Allah clearly lays out for us, implicitly, the types of Tawheed. Tawheed al-Rububiyyah, that there is only one Lord, only one Creator, only one Sustainer. Tawheed al-Isma'i wa-Sifat, that all of His names and attributes are unique and are names and attributes of perfection. And Tawheed al-Uluhiyyah, that only Allah Azza wa Jal deserves to be worshipped and no other deity deserves worship except Him. Likewise, this term is clearly mentioned in the Sunnah. In more than a dozen ahadith, the word Tawheed or its root is mentioned. And the most famous one being the hadith of Mu'adh. When he sent, when the Prophet ﷺ sent Mu'adh to Yemen, to Yemen, and he said, you are going to come to a people of the book, so let the first thing that you call them to be Tawheed. Likewise, in the hadith of Jabir, which is narrated in Sahih Muslim, that the Prophet, he said that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam ahalla bit tawheed, he declared the tawheed, meaning he declared the kalima, he declared labbaik Allahumma labbaik. And it is because of this that the term tawheed has always been in existence. If we even look at Sahih Bukhari, we find the last chapter entitled Kitab al tawheed Likewise, books were written on this topic entitled Kitab al tawheed There was a scholar by the name of Ibn Khuzayma who died 311 Hijri, and he entitled his book Kitab al-Tawheed. Likewise, Ibn Manda, who died 395, he entitled his book Kitab al-Tawheed. So those people who claim that this term Tawheed was invented in the 7th or 8th century or in the 12th century, they have no idea what they're talking about. This term is clearly found in the Sunnah, in more than a dozen ahadith, this term. Likewise, the scholars of the past used this term frequently. You all have to do, all you have to do is open up Sahih Bukhari and you find this term being used. So this is a refutation of those who claim that the term Tawheed is an innovation invented by some later scholar. We have now defined Tawheed. Let us now talk about the blessings of Tawheed. The blessings of this kalima, La ilaha illallah, which is the essence of Tawheed. There are many, many blessings of Tawheed. And in fact, it is true to say that we cannot even enumerate them, there are so many. But we will summarize these blessings by mentioning 10 of them. The first blessing of the kalima and of Tawheed is that it is because of Tawheed that Allah Azza wa Jal created us. As Allah says in the Quran, وَمَا خَلَقْتُ الْجِنَّ وَالْإِنسَ إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُونَ I have only created man and jinn to worship me. Allah has negated any other purpose of creation. There is no purpose of creation except for the pure worship of Allah. And that is why when we open up the Quran and we start reciting it, the first commandment that we find is what? Ya ayyuha nas, u'budu rabbakum. O mankind, worship your Lord who created you and who created those before you. So can there be anything more important than the very purpose of our existence? This is the first blessing of Tawheed. The second blessing of Tawheed and the second matter that shows you its status and its importance is the fact that it is because of Tawheed that Allah Azza wa Jal sent the prophets and He revealed the books. This is the only reason He did this. وَلَقَدْ بَعَثْنَا فِي كُلِّ أُمَّةٍ رَسُولًا أَنْ اللَّهَ وَاجْتَنِبُ الطَّاغُوتِ And we have sent in every single nation a messenger. Why? That they worship Allah Azza wa Jal and they avoid Taghut, all false deities. In another verse, وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَا مِنْ قَبْلِكَ إِلَّا وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَا, وما أرسلنا مِنْ قَبْلِكَ مِنْ رَسُولٍ إِلَّا نُوحِ إِلَيْهِ أَنَّهُ لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا أَنَا We have not sent before you any prophet except that we have inspired him, لا إله إلا أنا. This kalima is the reason why Allah sent the prophets. And it is the reason why He revealed the books as well. It was the same message of all the prophets. As Allah says in the Quran, that every single prophet from Nuh to Hud to Salih to Shu'ayb to all the early prophets, they said, Worship Allah, you have no God besides Him. 
The third matter which shows you the blessings and the importance of this topic of Tawheed is that this kalima of La ilaha illallah is the weightiest matter in the scales. There is nothing that is heavier than it. In an authentic hadith, Musa alayhi salam asks Allah, he says, Oh Allah, teach me a phrase that I can worship you by. So Allah Azza wa Jal says, Oh Musa, say La ilaha illallah. Musa says, Oh Allah, all of your creation is saying this. In other words, he wants something specific. He wants something special, he thinks. He wants something above La ilaha illallah. He says, La ilaha illallah, everyone is saying it's something common. So Allah Azza wa Jal responds, Ya Musa, if everything of the heavens and all that is in them, and the earths and all that is in them, all of the earths and all of the heavens, if they were put on one side of the scale, and La ilaha illallah was placed on the other side, La ilaha illallah would outweigh the other side. Showing you the importance and the status of the simple kalima of La ilaha illallah. The fourth matter which shows you the importance of this kalima is it is because of this kalima that the Muslim is differentiated from the kafir, that the inhabitant of Jannah is differentiated from the inhabitant of the fire of hell. As Allah says in the Quran, Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu, aminu billahi wa rasooli. O you who believe, believe in Allah and His Messenger, and in the Day of Judgment, and that which has been revealed to the Prophet, and that which has been revealed to those before Him. And whoever disbelieves in Allah, and the angels, and the books, and the Day of Judgment, is the one who has gone astray. There are only two categories of people, the mu'min, or the Muslim, and the kafir. And what is the basis of differentiation? Allegiance to La ilaha illallah. In fact, La ilaha illallah is the height of Iman. As the Prophet sallallahu wasallam said, that Iman is composed of 73 odd branches. The highest of it, the highest branch, is the statement of La ilaha illallah. So La ilaha illallah enters you into Iman, the lowest of Iman. And then perfection to it causes you to be raised to the height of Iman. It is only through La ilaha illallah and allegiance to La ilaha illallah and following La ilaha illallah and implementing La ilaha illallah that you rise in the ranks of Iman. Why? Because the kafir, how does he accept Islam? By La ilaha illallah. So that is the lowest level. And yet the Prophet is saying that is the highest level as well. Meaning the one thing that is in common between the lowest and the highest, the one ladder that you can use to climb it, is your allegiance to, your implementation of La ilaha illallah. The fifth matter which shows you the blessings of this kalima and of Tawheed is that this is the only path that one can take if he wishes to achieve success and happiness in this life and in the hereafter. To live a contented, a peaceful, a serene life in this world before the life of the hereafter, the only way to do so is through Tawheed. It will not be through money, nor status, nor fame, nor power, nor riches, nor wealth, nor women, nor family. Nothing will give the satisfaction of the heart like Tawheed will give. فَمَنْ أَعْرَضَ عَنْ ذِكْرِي فَإِنَّ لَهُ مَعِيشَةً ضَنْكَ وَنَحْشُرُهُ يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ أَعْمَى Whoever turns away from remembering me, from worshipping me, then he will live a difficult life, a constrained life. Whoever turns away from remembering me, who will not worship me, he will never obtain happiness in this life. As Allah says in another verse, Ala bi dhikrillahi tatma'innul qulub. Verily, only through the remembrance of Allah will the hearts find peace and tranquility. The only way that tranquility will be achieved in this life is through following Allah, worshipping Allah, loving Allah, obeying Allah. And this is the only way that a person will live successfully, happily, in this life before the life of the hereafter. The sixth blessing of Tawheed is that this is the first matter that the Prophet ﷺ and in fact Allah both have commanded us to call to. There is nothing that we should call to when we're calling to Islam before Tawheed. As the Prophet ﷺ said to Mu'adh ibn Jabal like we quoted before, that when he sent him to Yemen, he said, O Mu'adh, let the first thing that you call them to be, Tawheed. And Mu'adh ibn Jabal is one of the greatest scholars of the Sahaba. And one of the most beloved to the Prophet wasallam. So much so that he told Mu'adh, Oh Mu'adh, I love you for the sake of Allah. Ya Mu'adh, inni uhibbuk. 
And when he's sending him to Yemen to be the leader of the people of Yemen, the governor of Yemen, he instructs him with some jewels of wisdom. And the first jewel that he gives him, let the first thing that you call them to be, and you Allah Ta'ala, that they make Allah one, that they believe in La ilaha illallah. And this is the call of the Quran as well, that the first commandment of the Quran, as we know, is Ya ayyuhan nas, u'budu rabbakum. The seventh matter which shows you the importance of this concept of Tawheed is that this is the right that Allah Azza wa Jal has over us. In the famous hadith of also another hadith of Mu'adh where, where the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was riding with Mu'adh ibn Jabal on a donkey together on the same donkey. He said, Ya Mu'adh, do you know what the right of Allah is over his servant? And Mu'adh out of modesty replied, Allah and his messenger know best. So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Ya Mu'adh, the right of Allah over his servant is that they worship him alone and do not associate partners with him. This is the right that Allah has over us. Now Allah Azza has many rights, but by singling out this one, the Prophet is telling us this is the first and the final commandment, the primary commandment, that worship Allah alone and worship nothing besides him. And then he said, do you know what the right of the servant is over Allah? And this is a right that is not something that we can claim, but Allah has given it to us. It is a blessing from Allah that He has given us this right. It is not something that we deserve or we owe or we own. It is something that Allah has given us from His blessings. That if we do this, like the Prophet said, if we worship Him alone, then He will not punish us. And this is enough of a blessing to show you the importance of this concept of Tawheed. The eighth matter which shows you the importance of Tawheed is that it is through Tawheed that a person enters Jannah. As the Prophet ﷺ said, whoever's last word, whoever's last word was La ilaha illallah will enter Jannah. Whoever said at the end of his life, right before death comes to him, La ilaha illallah will enter Jannah. And a person who does not have this statement, La ilaha illallah, and he never said it, then of course he will never be able to Jannah. But out of Allah's blessings, if someone ha makes a habit of saying it all the time, then it is the sunnah of Allah that a person dies loving and saying that which was beloved to him in his life. So if a person made La ilaha illallah something beloved to him, then inshaAllah before he dies, Allah Azza wa will give him the power and the capability to say it before the angel of death comes. And because of this, Allah Azza wa will cause him to enter Jannah. The ninth blessing of Tawheed, and of this kalima is that it forgives all sins and it prevents a person from entering the fire of hell. The Prophet wasallam said that whoever testifies La ilaha illallah wahdahu la sharika lah and Muhammadun abduhu wa rasuluh and he testifies that Isa is also the messenger of Allah and his word that he gave to Maryam and a spirit from him and that Jannah is true and Nar is true then Allah will cause him to enter Jannah no matter what he has done. As long as he was pure and sincere to these simple fundamentals of La ilaha illallah, Muhammadur Rasulullah, and he didn't go to the extremes of the Christians or the Jews, and he said that Isa is also a messenger of Allah and the son of Maryam, and a spirit proceeding from him. And he believes in Jannah and Nar, Allah will cause him to enter Jannah no matter what he has done. In another hadith, the Prophet wasallam said, there was a man <coughs> amongst the people before you and the children of Israel, he never did any good. لم يعمل خيرا قط إلا التوحيد Except for Tawheed. Notice the Prophet wasallam used this word Tawheed. So it cannot be an invention of a 7th century scholar. Here it is in the Musnad Imam Ahmad where the Prophet wasallam clearly says, he didn't do any good except Tawheed. He uses the word Tawheed as it is Tawheed. And then he narrated the, the story and he said, when death came to him, this man, he said to his family, that when I die, I want you to burn my body. And then to take the ashes and throw them in the sand. In a very windy day, not just on any day, on a very windy day. So when he died, his children and his family members, they did what he wanted them to do. So Allah Azza wa Jal told the angels to go, and collect his ashes from the left and from the right and from the east and from the west. And Allah resurrected him. And he said, O oh, son of Adam, why did you do what you did? Why did you do what you did? He said, O oh, my Lord, out of a fear for you, I was scared that if you resurrected me, that you would punish me. 
So Allah Azza wa Jal says that because of this, because of this fear, I have forgiven you. And then the Prophet ﷺ emphasized, he didn't do any good except Tawheed. Once again, he emphasized it at the end of the hadith. He never did any good except Tawheed. In another hadith, which also proves this, and this is the hadith known as the hadith of the bitaqa, the hadith of the card. The Prophet ﷺ said that there will be a person from my ummah on the day of judgment, he will be called out to in front of everyone. Everyone will see him. And his good deeds and his bad deeds will be brought forth. 99 scrolls of bad deeds. And they will be placed on the left hand of the scale. As far as he can see, he will be able to see these scrolls. So Allah Azza wa Jal will ask him, O oh my servant, Ya Abdi, do you deny any of this that you see in front of you? So the servant will lower his head and he, say, and he will say, No, my Lord, I do not deny it. Then Allah Azza wa Jal will say, Have my servants, meaning the angels who wrote your scrolls, have they done you any injustice? Have they wronged you? Have they done something they shouldn't have done? Have they written something they shouldn't have written? He will respond, No, my Lord, they have not. So then Allah will ask him, Do you have any good deed to show? These are your evil deeds. Do you have any good deed to show? He will say out of shame, No, my Lord, I have no good deed to show. So Allah Azza wa Jal will say, No, you do have a good deed. And today you will not be shown any injustice. And then one card, bitaqa, will be brought out. And on it will be written, La ilaha illallah. And it will be placed on the right hand of the scale. So the man will say, Oh, my Lord, of what use will this one card be against the 99 scrolls, 99 books? So Allah Azza wa Jal will say, this is your good deed and today you will not be shown any injustice. Today you will receive the exact reward of your good and your evil together. And when that card will be placed on the right hand of this scale, the left side will go flying up and the right side will go down. The weight of La ilaha illallah. A person who practices La ilaha illallah, believes in it, perfects it, it will, it will destroy all of his sins. It will forgive all of his sins, as this hadith of the Bitaqa shows. But this is only the one who fulfilled these conditions, who understood it, who practiced it. The final blessing that we will mention, and we cannot say this is the final blessing, because there are too many blessings of this kalima. The final blessing which makes us realize the importance of this concept of Tawheed, is by realizing the dangers of the opposite of Tawheed, which is Shirk. By appreciating how dangerous the opposite of Tawheed is, we automatically understand how beautiful and how noble and how important the concept of Tawheed is. And the opposite of Tawheed is Shirk or associating partners with Allah. And the sins and the dangers of Shirk are so many of them is that this is the only unforgivable sin. إِنَّ اللَّهَ لَا يَغْفِرُ أَنْ يُشْرَكَ بِهِ وَيَغْفِرُ مَا دُونَ ذَلِكَ لِمَنْ يَشَاءَ As Allah says twice in the Qur'an, Allah Azza wa Jal will not forgive that shirk be done with him. And he will forgive anything else besides this. Anything else below shirk, it is possible Allah will forgive it. As for the sin of shirk, it will not be forgiven. So these are ten blessings of Tawheed that I have mentioned. And as we said, they cannot be enumerated in complete completely because they are more than can be mentioned. What can be more important than the purpose of creation? What can be more important than the reason why Allah sent the prophets, revealed the books? What can be more important than that which differentiates the Muslim from the Kafir, the person of Jannah from the person of Nar? The matter which will cause all of your sins to be forgiven. It is therefore no surprise that the Prophet ﷺ said that أَفْضَلُ مَا قُلْتْ The best thing that I have said when نَبِيُّونَ قَبْلِي and all the prophets before me the best thing that I have said, there is nothing better than this. And the prophets before me, the best thing that they have said, Ashhadu Allah illallah, wahdahu la sharika lah, lahul mulk wa lahul hamd wa huwa ala kulli shayin qadir. I bear witness and testify that la ilaha illallah, there is, he is alone, having no partners. To him belongs the kingdom, and to him belongs all praise, and he is capable of all things. This one kalima, the kalima to tawheed, is the best and most blessed and most noble speech that all the prophets have ever said. It is therefore no surprise to find that the entire Qur'an is nothing but a call to Tawheed. 
every single verse in the Quran is nothing except a call to Tawheed. As Ibn al-Qayyim mentions, that all the verses in the Quran can be categorized in one of five categories. The first category are those verses, those verses which describe Allah Azza wa Jal and describe His names and attributes. And this is the essence of Tawheed, who Allah is. For example, Surah Al-Ikhlas, قُلْ هُوَ اللَّهُ أَحَدْ اللَّهُ الصَّمَدْ لَمْ يُلَدْ وَلَمْ يُلَدْ وَلَمْ يُكُلْ لَوْ كُفُونَ أَحَدْ Why is this surah equivalent to a third of the Qur'an? Because even though it is only three or four verses, it talks about one third of Tawheed, Tawheed Al-Asma'i Wa Sifat. Tawheed of Allah's names and attributes. This one small surah is equivalent to a third of the Qur'an because it summarizes for you who our Lord is. This is the first category of verses. Another example, هو الله الذي لا إله إلا هو الملك القدوس السلام المؤمن المهيمن العزيز الجبار المتكبر All of these names and attributes of Allah. الحمد لله رب العالمين الرحمن الرحيم مالك يوم الدين All of these verses, they describe who Allah is. This is the first category. The second category are those verses which direct us to worship Allah alone. And this is توحيد الألوهية. For example, إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين for example, Surah Al-Ikhlas in its entirety, قُلْ يَا أَيُّهَا الْكَافِرُونَ لَا أَعْبُدُ مَا تَعْبُدُونَ I will not worship what you worship, nor will you worship what I worship, nor will I worship what you worship. You have your deen and I have my deen. Clear-cut differentiation. These are the verses which command mankind to worship Allah alone and only Allah. This is the second category. And this is Tawheed al uluhiyyah The third category are those verses, those verses which describe the Sharia, which describe the halal and the haram. And this is the perfection of Tawheed. How do you worship Allah? What do you do to please Allah? Do this, do not do this, pray five times a day, avoid this and this. All of the verses which have the commandments of the Sharia, the fiqhi verses if you like, they are a manifestation of Tawheed because they tell you what to do, how to worship Allah. The fourth category of verses are the verses which describe the stories of the people of Tawheed, of the prophets of old, and of the blessings of the people of Tawheed of the hereafter, meaning the blessings of Jannah. So they describe what happened and what will happen to the people of Tawheed. All of the stories of the prophets, and the problems that they met and their successes, and all of the descriptions of Jannah, all of this is only a manifestation of the blessings of Tawheed in this world and the hereafter. And the final category, the fifth category of verses, are those verses which describe the people of shirk, the opposite of Tawheed. And the punishments that befell them in this life, the punishments of Fir'aun, of the people of Ad and Thamud, of all of the people before us who rejected Allah. And the punishments of the fire of hell that await them in the hereafter. This is the response, or this is the uh, what the, the what will happen to those who reject Tawheed in this world and in the hereafter. Humiliation in this life, a shameful death in this life, and a severe and everlasting torment in the hereafter. So these are the five categories of verses. You can take every single verse of the Qur'an without exception and easily categorize it into one of these five. And we find that each one of these five is directly related to Tawheed. This shows you that the entire Qur'an is nothing but an explanation of La ilaha illallah. The entire Quran is nothing but a call to Tawheed and an explanation of what Tawheed is and a description of its meanings. Bismillah, inna alhamdulillahi nahmaduhu wa nasta'inuhu wa nasta'gfiruhu wa na'udhu billahi min shuroori anfusina wa min sayyati a'malina man yahdihi allahu falamudilla lah wa man yudlilhu falahadiya lah wa ashadu an la ilaha illa Allah wahdahu la sharika lah wa ashadu anna muhammadan abduhu wa rasooluh Amma ba'd After this brief introduction regarding the blessings of Tawheed and the fact that the entire Quran is nothing except a call to Tawheed, we now move on to the precise meaning of the types of Tawheed. What is Tawheed al rububiyyah What is Tawheed al uluhiyyah What is Tawheed al asmai wa sifat Because by understanding of these three types of Tawheed, we will be able to understand the meaning of La ilaha illallah better. So we start off with the first type, Tawheed al rububiyyah or Tawheed of Allah in the fact that He is the Rabb. You unify Allah that there is only one Rabb. So we have to define then what is the meaning of Rabb. 
if you go back to the classical Arabic dictionaries, the most famous one being Lisan al-Arab of Ibn Manzur, and this book is one of the most standard references of the Arabic language, uh, you find that he says that the Rabb in the Arabic language is uh, a Malik, a Sayyid, a Mudabbir, a Murabbi, a Qayyim, a Mun'im. We'll translate this now. That basically a Rabb is an owner or the one who is obeyed or the one who nourishes and sustains or the one who causes an object to grow or the one who is beneficent, beneficent to the object. Okay, So the Rabb is the one who is the true owner. The true Sayyid, meaning the one who is obeyed. The Mudabbir, the one who controls the affairs. The Murabbi, the one who gives tarbiyah, the one who nourishes and sustains. The Mun'im, he gives. This is the Rabb. So when we combine all of these three, uh, all of these definitions, we find that all of them center around three aspects. Tawheed al rububiyyah it centers around three aspects. Firstly, that Allah Azza wa Jal is the true and complete owner. And if he is the true owner, this means he is the one that created us. Because the one that creates an object is the complete owner. And he is not like the one who uh, buys, for example, or takes another created object. The one who actually, for example, the inventor, when he makes his creation, he is the one that has the complete and true ownership to it. So the fact that Allah is the true owner automatically necessitates and implies that he is the true and only creator. So there is no creator except Allah. So the first aspect of Rubiya, he is the true and complete owner. He owns us and part of that complete ownership is that he is the one that has created us as well. The second aspect of Tuhid al-Rububiya is that Allah Azza wa Jal is the one who has the right to be obeyed. This is the meaning of Rabb as well, the one who is obeyed. And this implies that he is the true king, Al-Malik, Al-Malik. He is the true king. No one has the right to be obeyed or the right to legislate except him. This is a part of the meaning of Rabb. And the third connotation of Rabb is the one who nourishes, who takes care of, who sustains. And this is why Allah is Ar-Razaq. He gives. No one gives except Allah. No one sustains, no one nourishes except Allah. So these are the three meanings of Rabb. When we say Tawheed al-Rububiyyah, then this means Allah Azza wa Jal is unique in that He is the true owner. He is unique in that He is the only one that has the right to be obeyed. And He is unique in that He is the only one who nourishes and who sustains and who takes care of us. You can summarize Tawheed al-Rububiyyah and state that Tawheed al-Rububiyyah means to unify Allah, to make Allah is unique in all of His actions, the actions of Allah Azza wa Jal. Allah is the only one who creates, who sustains, who legislates, who has the right to be obeyed. So Tawheed of Allah in His actions, in the actions of Allah. Allah is the only one who does all of these things. This is Tawheed al-Rububiyyah. Nothing occurs except by His will. And no one can overcome or escape His will. Nothing escapes His knowledge. Nothing escapes His creation. He is the one, He is the only creator. So Tawheed of Allah in His actions, this is Tawheed al rububiyyah And by this we understand that all of the creation is under the rububiyyah of Allah. It is not possible except that a created object comes under the rububiyyah of Allah. As Allah says in the Qur'an, وَلَهُ أَسْلَمَ مَنْ فِي السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ طَوْعًا وَكَرْهًا And to Him, all that is in the heavens and earth have submitted, willingly or unwillingly, meaning to this rububiyyah. No one can escape from the rububiyyah of Allah. If Allah desires something, Allah created him in the first place. And he cannot escape this. And whatever Allah wills will happen to him whether he likes it or not. And Allah is the one that nourishes him whether he believes in Allah or not. No one can overcome the rububiyyah of Allah. بَلَّهُ مَا فِي السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ كُلُّ لَهُ قَانِتُونَ To him belongs all that is in the heavens and earth. Everything has submitted itself to him. Now obviously those that believe in Allah have a special rububiyyah, a special protection. There's no doubt about this. But all of the creation comes under a general rububiyyah. So we can say that rububiyyah is in fact of two types. A general rububiyyah, that the Muslims and the Kafirs all come under this. That Allah created them and Allah sustains them and Allah nourishes them and the will of Allah is executed upon them. And then the specific rububiyyah, which is that Allah's extra protection comes upon those who believe in Him. Extra nourishment, extra care comes upon those who believe in him. What is the proof of rububiyyah? How do we know that there is a Rabb? 
How do we know that there is a uh, creator? And this is something that is a very common concept or topic in the Western world, and they call it the proofs for the existence of God. How do we know that there is a God or a creator? Uh, we call it out of respect, Tawheed al rububiya proofs of Tawheed al rububiya because in reality, uh, the concept of atheism and denying that there is a God is a very, very uh, small and minority concept throughout the centuries, throughout the ages. And in fact, before this century, it was almost unheard of. It was very rare to find an atheistic society. Only in our times with the spread of capital, capitalism and materialism and the dunya and communism, when these different philosophies have come forth, they have people had the luxury to deny the existence of Allah. The fact of the matter is throughout history, atheism has always been, and even in our times, it's a very, very small minority. We know that the Western philosophies pay a lot of attention to this topic. What is the proof for the existence of God? And if you go back to the earliest works of Aristotle and Plato and Socrates and the works after them of Thomas Aquinas and Descartes and all of these, uh, the, one of the famous ones being uh, the, the, the proofs of God that Thomas Aquinas has. He has, he has the standard uh, proofs of the Western world if you like. He has five proofs that he has. Basically they concentrate a lot on this topic. Thousands of works, hundreds of different ideas and ways, many books written. When you turn to the Qur'an, you find surprisingly that this topic is hardly mentioned. It's hardly mentioned, the Qur'an, it's as if it doesn't really care about this. How to prove that there is a God. You can count the number of verses that are directed to those who deny God on one hand. That's how few they are. And the reason being that Islam takes it for granted that this is something common sense. To deny that there is a creator means that a person is a madman, a fool. He is denying something which, is, which cannot be denied. As one poet versified in Arabic, I'll translate it into English, he said, how can you prove something to which every single object is, is a proof of its existence? Why do you waste your trying trying to prove something when every single object screams out at its existence? And this is exactly the philosophy, if you like, for lack of a better term, or the, the manhaj is a better word, the methodology of the Qur'an. The Qur'an doesn't concentrate on this topic that much. And this is, in, this is in contrast to the philosophers and the Muslim groups that have been influenced by philosophy. Those Muslim groups that have been influenced by philosophers, such as the Mu'tazila and the Ash'a'ira and the Maturidiyya, these groups, their emphasis always is on trying to prove Allah exists. If you open any of their books, the first discussion always starts, how do you prove that there is a God? And they discuss this in hundreds of pages sometimes in their classical works. But the Qur'an and the Sunnah hardly talks about this because it's something that is taken for granted. So what are the proofs of the existence of Allah? There are four or five that we'll mention. And again, like we said, it's, it's really ridiculous to enumerate them because they are every single object is a proof of its existence. But to categorize it nicely, we'll say the first proof is the creation itself. You look around you, where did we come from? How did we come here? What is the origin of us and everything around us? As Allah says in the Quran, in Surah At-Tur, أَمْ خُلِقُوا مِنْ غَيْرِ شَيْءٍ أَمْ هُمُ الْخَالِقُونَ Were they created out of nothing? Or did they create themselves? Allah asks two rhetorical questions. And He doesn't ask the third one because it is understood. The two questions, there are, there are three logical possibilities, right? Either there is a God who created you, or nothing created you, or you created yourselves. So Allah Azza wa Jal asks two questions and He leaves the third. He doesn't ask it because it's understood. Did they create themselves or were they created out of nothing? If neither of these two is true, then there's only one which is the truth and that is that Allah is the one who created you. Am خُلِقُوا مِنْ غَيْرِ شَيْءٍ أَمْ هُمُ الْخَالِقُونَ Were they created out of nothing or did they create themselves? Now the modern philosophers and the modern Western philosophy, it follows the second question. We came out of nothing. That's what they say, the Big Bang. And then everything just evolved from there. And yet, this, this simple uh, concept that they have, it is so ludicrous. They themselves will not believe it. If you were to ask one of them, suppose you were to see a, a run-down shack, or any, even the worst type of career, even two sticks put together. And you were to try to convince them that this came out of nothing that the wind was blown and this happened and that happened and it was formed by itself. He would not believe you. Even if he didn't see footprints, he didn't see any sign of civilization. If there was a carving in the stone, if there was a, stool or, a, a tool or instrument there, he would conclude that there must have been life here. 
then why is it that when he sees life itself, he doesn't realize that there is a creator to this life? And there is a famous story of Imam Abu Hanifa, rahimahullah, that once there was a small group of atheists in the time of the Khalifa of his time, and they said, we wish to debate with you concerning the existence of God. They went to the Khalifa and they said, we want to debate with you. Send us your most powerful scholar. So the Khalifa called Abu Hanifa and he set a specific time and place and said, come at this time and place. So the other people, the atheists, they showed up at the proper time and place. Abu Hanifa was not there. And they waited for hours and hours and he didn't come until they were about to leave. And they said, what type of scholar is this? He doesn't come on time. When they were about to leave, Abu Hanifa entered the place. So they became angry at him and said, what type of scholar are you that you don't even come on time and this and that? So Abu Hanifa said, wait, let me explain what happened. If it's a reasonable excuse, will you excuse me? They said, yes, we'll excuse you. Give us a, a good excuse. So he said, while I was coming here, I happened to come across a river. And the ferry to cross the river, he, it was not there. So that's why I was late. I waited and waited and the ferry never came. So they said, Abu Hanifa, if the ferry never came, how did you cross the river? So he said, while I was waiting, I saw that the branches fell out from the tree in front of me. And they automatically came together to form a raft. And then the leaves started falling and intertwining to form rope. And then the rope just happened to come and fall and form lines of, and string or, and to tie the raft together. So they started laughing and they said to the Khalifa, you expect us to believe this man? He is a madman, he is a fool. So Abu Hanifa said, who are the real fools? You or me? You who are not willing to believe that even a ship created itself and yet you claim that the entire earth and the entire creation came out of nothing. Who are the real fools? You won't believe me when I say that a, a, a raft, a ship that is not even alive, could not be created itself. And yet you claim that the entire creation was created by itself. So look at the tactics of Abu Hanifa. فَبُهِتَ الَّذِي kafar. They could not respond to this and he won the argument. But the point is, it is something so clear. As Allah says in another verse, هَذَا خَلْقُ اللَّهِ فَأَرُونِي مَاذَا خَلَقَ الَّذِينَ مِن دُونِهِ This is the creation of Allah. So show me what have those besides Him created. Where is the creation of other than Allah? As Allah says in another verse, that the, those whom you call out to besides Allah, they cannot create anything. They have not created anything. It is only Allah Azza wa Jal who is the creator. So this is the first proof that there is a Rabb. You look around you. The perfect harmony of creation. Everything is so perfect. And if any person studies any science, whether it be biology, chemistry, astronomy, physics, you can do nothing but marvel at how everything is so perfect. Simple things like the composition of the air that we breathe. Had it been a little bit different, we would not be able to survive. The water cycle, the distance of the earth from the sun. Look at how if we, during winter and, the, and summer, how the difference of the seasons is. And this is only the difference of, I think, 0.01% between the summer and the winter. Imagine a few hundred miles, a few thousand miles, we would not be able to live on the face of this earth. Everything is so perfect. No matter what science you look into, it came out of nothing. As Allah says, أَمْ خُلِقُوا مِنْ غَيْرِ شَيْنْ أَمْ الْخَالِقُونَ did they create themselves or did they, did they come out of nothing? No, it is rather the third and that is that Allah Azza wa Jal created us. So this is the first proof of creation. <coughs> the second proof of creation is human instinct, fitrah. Human instinct, one's innate nature, it tells you that there is a creator. And this instinct was, cre was placed in us by Allah Azza wa Jal. Every single human being has this fitrah inside of him. As the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Every single human being is born upon the fitrah. Every child, male or female, Muslim or kafir, when he is born, he is upon the fitrah. Then his parents transform him into a Christian or a Jew or a Megan or anything else, Majusi, anything else. But the child is born upon a clear and pure fitrah. That if he were left without any interfering circumstances, he would grow up believing in one God. And this is why so many people are guided to Islam. Because it appeals to one's innate nature, fitrah. When they hear the message of Islam, they say, this is what I've been looking for. This is what I want. Where did this yearning and desire come from? Allah placed it in all of, all of the children of Adam. The Quran and Sunnah have come conforming to man's fitrah. 
So when man has been corrupted from his fitrah and he hears the Qur'an and Sunnah, automatically he finds a yearning, a desire to return to that fitrah. Therefore, people always convert to Islam and no one leaves Islam after having tasted it because it conforms to the fitrah. And this is also referred to as the mithaq or the covenant. Allah Azza wa Jal, when He created Adam, He made a covenant with Adam and all of the children of Adam. And this is mentioned in the Quran, Surah A'raf verse 172. Remember when we took a covenant with the children of Adam, that basically Allah Azza wa Jal, and this is mentioned in the hadith as well, that Allah Azza wa Jal, He placed Adam in a Nu'man, a valley of Arafat, and He extracted from the loins of Adam all of the children of Adam that will come till the day of judgment. And He spread them out in front of Him. All of mankind, we were there as well, all of us. And He asked them, Alastu bi Rabbikum, am I not your Lord? And all of us and all of mankind responded, Bala, yes, you are our Lord. So this was the mithaq that Allah Azza wa Jal placed in all of us. But we do not remember the mithaq, but the remnants of that mithaq are in our fitrah. We do not physically remember it, but that mithaq remains with us. How? In our human nature, our fitrah. And it is because of this mithaq that every human being knows right from wrong. Everyone knows that murdering and stealing and raping and, and lying are sins. Why? Why do they know this? Where did it come from? Every society knows this. Why? Because it is a part of the fitrah. Likewise, every single human being, it is a part of the fitrah, that tawheed, that Allah is one. He might not even know the name Allah, but he knows there is only one God. And that I should worship this God. This is a part of the fitrah. So this is yet another evidence of tawheed al the fitrah itself. The third evidence is that all of mankind has an innate feeling of helplessness, of turning to the Creator. No human being is devoid of this feeling. And this feeling is particularly manifested at times of distress, at times of, of difficulties and problems. Even the atheists, even the non-Muslims who don't believe in a God, when it is a matter of life and death for themselves or their loved ones, automatically they, they call out, Oh God, save me. Oh God, do this. They might not even have believed in God. And how many are the stories all of us know, especially those who deal with converts, that they might not even have worshipped God, not even Christian, not even nothing. And yet when they're in a situation of life and death, when they're in a situation of, of difficulty, instinctively, automatically, they don't think about it. They call out, Oh God, help me. And this is something that the Qur'an mentions in many verses. When any problem afflicts mankind, he calls out to us. Sitting and standing, whatever situation is, he calls out to us. And then when we respond to him, he rejects us. Also this, when they are riding the waves, so many verses in the Qur'an, that when they are riding on the ocean and the waves are about to drown them, they call out to Allah to save them. And when he saves them to the shore, then they reject him and neglect him. Where does this feeling come from in all of mankind? It is once again a manifestation of rububiyyah of Allah. That we are not the ones who control our destiny. We do not have all powers. There is someone who does control it. There is someone who knows. There is someone who cares. There is someone who created us. And that is our Rabb. The fourth evidence of rububiyyah, of the Rabb, of, that, Allah, that there is a Rabb and that Allah is our Rabb, is the sending of the prophets and the revelation of the books. So the prophets have come to establish the hujjah or the evidence against us, against mankind. And they are sent with clear proofs, mu'jizat, miracles. All the prophets have been sent with miracles. There is not a single prophet except that he has been blessed with miracles from Allah. So Musa was given the miracle of the staff and the miracle of the hand and the parting of the Nile. Isa was given the raising of the dead and the healing of the leper and the sick and curing the blind by the permission of Allah. And the Prophet ﷺ was given so many miracles, the great of being the Qur'an, so on and so forth. Clear proof that there is a Rabb. Likewise, the message that they, came, that they come with, all of these Prophets, the clear, the beautiful message of Islam, the message of Tawheed, of Iman, Look at the man-made religions. Look at Hinduism. Look at Confucianism, Buddhism, any, any ism besides Islam. 
Look at even Christianity and Judaism, which are originally revealed religions, but they have been corrupted. They do not conform to common sense, to logic, to, to human emotion and reason. They do not conform to the fitrah, how they describe God, what is the rights of God over us. And look at Islam, the beauty, the simplicity, the purity, the pristineness. This is a clear proof that there is a Rabb. And that this Rabb cares about us, that is a part of being a Rabb, the tarbiyah. And that is why he has sent prophets and he has sent and revealed books so that we can be guided to his worship. And there are other proofs as well, but these are the four main ones we'll discuss. So this is Tawheed al rububiyyah and this is the proofs of the Rubiyyah of Allah. The question arises though, now that we've defined Rabb and shown his evidences, is it enough to believe that there is a Rabb? Is it enough to believe in Tawheed al rububiyyah And this is the next topic. That it is not sufficient to believe only that there is a God. If someone believes this, then it is not sufficient for him. And this also proves that the meaning of the kalima is not there is no God except Allah. This is an incorrect translation because this is rububiya. There is no God except Allah. If this were the meaning of the kalima, then most of mankind would be Muslim. There is no creator except one creator. If this were the meaning of the kalima, then the majority of mankind would be Muslim. Ask the Christians, who created you? God Almighty. Ask the Jews, who created you? God Almighty. Ask the Hindus, how many gods are there? They will say millions. They say, no, how many supreme gods? The main god. They will say, yes, yes, there is one main god, Vishnu, and he created all the other gods. There is one supreme god, even in their theology. Even though they are the most mushrik and idolatrous society, yet even in their aqidah, even in their faith, it all goes back to one supreme God. So almost every religion would be Muslim and would be considered Muslim if this were the meaning of the kalima, that there is no God and there is no Rabb except for one Rabb. Even the mushrikun of the Prophet's time believe that there is no Rabb except for Allah and they called him Allah. So had the meaning of the kalima been there is no God except Allah, then all the mushrikun would have been considered to be Muslims. So why did they reject Islam? Why did the Prophet ﷺ fight them? Why did he take them as slaves and captives and consider their blood and property to be lawful? If they believed in the kalima according to the, that interpretation of the kalima, because they didn't understand the meaning or excuse me, they didn't believe in the proper meaning of the kalima. Even the mushrikun believed in Allah and they believed that He was the Rabb. And this is the, the topic we're going to prove now that the mushrikun believed in Allah Azza wa Jal. Why is this topic important? Because by proving that the mushrikun believed in Allah and believed that He was the Rabb, we automatically prove that the kalima is more than rububiyyah. We automatically prove that it is not sufficient to believe that Allah is the Rabb and that's it. And this is why this topic is very important. The proofs that the mushrikun believed in Allah as a Rabb and that He is the only Rabb. Had the meaning of the kalima been, there is no Rabb except for Allah, there is no creator and, and God except for Allah, then the mushrikun would be Muslims. Of the Prophet's time, Abu Jahl and Abu Talib and all of them would be considered Muslims. So what is the proof that the mushrikun believed in Allah and believed that He was the Rabb? The first proof for this, are clear verses in the Quran which state that the Jahiliya Arabs, the Mushrikun, they believe that Allah created and sustained them. As Allah says, وَلَا إِن سَأَلْتَهُمْ مَنْ خَلَقَ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضَ وَسَخَّرَ الشَّمْسَ وَالْقَمَرَ لَيَقُولُنَّ اللَّهِ If you were to ask them, meaning the Mushrikun, who created the heavens and the earth, and who set or aligned the sun and the moon, they would say Allah. So Allah says, فَأَنَّا يُؤْفَكُونَ How are they? Deluded. If you were to ask them who sends the rain down from the skies and brings the earth back to life, they would say Allah. If you were to ask them who created you, they would say Allah. Clear cut ayat which show without a shadow, beyond a shadow of a doubt, that the mushrikun believe that Allah is their creator, that He is their Rabb, that He gives them their sustenance, that He sends the rain down, that He brings the earth back to life. Is this not rububiyyah? 
Did not the mushrikun believe in it as per the Quran? And in a very beautiful series of passages, Surah Mu'minun, verses 84 to 89, Allah Azza wa Jal says, Ask them, who does the earth and all that is in it belong to? They will say, Allah. Say, will you not then remember? Say, Ask them, who is the Lord of the seven heavens and the Lord of the majestic throne? They will say, Allah. Why do you not have taqwa? Say, in whose hands is the kingdom, in other words, the power of everything? And he is the one who protects and nothing can protect against him. Is this not rububiyyah? That he is the one who is all powerful. He is the one who protects. He is the one you turn to for help. And nothing can save you from him. He protects and nothing can protect against him. They will say Allah. The mushrikun. So Allah is asking them, why do they not have iman? Why do they not have taqwa? Why do they not believe? So belief is more than this. Look at this. The Quran is clearly telling you, asking them, why do they not have taqwa of Allah? Why do they not think? Why do they not accept iman? Showing you that had iman been rububiyyah, Allah would not be asking them this. Iman is more than rububiyyah. Another evidence that the Jahiliya Arabs believed in Allah is those verses which clearly show that the Arabs had some iman in Allah, but they committed shirk. Of them is Surah Yusuf, verse 106. Most of them, they have Iman in Allah, but they commit shirk as well. Ibn Abbas and his students, Ikrimah and Qatad and Mujahid and others, they said their Iman in Allah is if you were to ask them who created them, they would say Allah. And who created the heavens and the earth, they would say Allah. And who created the skies and the, and the, and the mountains, they would say Allah. This is their Iman, Rububiyyah. And their shirk is that they worship other than Allah. So this is their iman. They believed in Allah as the Rabb. As the Quran clearly says, they had some iman. But you have iman in Allah and you commit shirk, there is no iman that is acceptable in the sight of Allah. The third evidence that shows you that the Arabs believed, the mushrikun believed in Allah, is the excuse and that he was the Rabb, is the excuse that they would use to justify their shirk. They would use two primary excuses, as the Quran says. The first one, وَيَعْبُدُونَ مِن دُونِ اللَّهِ مَا لَا يَضُرُّهُمْ وَلَا يَنْفَعُهُمْ وَيَقُولُونَ هَأُولَاءِ شُفَعَاؤُنَا عِنْدَ اللَّهِ Surah Yunus, verse 18. And they worship besides Allah, that which will neither harm them nor benefit them. And they say, these objects, meaning these gods that they worship, they are our intercessors, intermediaries between us and Allah. What does this show you? This shows you that they believed Allah is the Supreme Lord. And that the other gods that they worship, Allah, Al-Uzza, Al-Manat, they would use them as intermediaries to go to Allah. This shows you that they believed Allah is the Supreme Rabb. They didn't deny Allah, they didn't reject Allah. But they would go through objects to reach Allah. This was the first excuse. And the second excuse, مَا نَعْبُدُهُمْ إِلَّا لِيُقَرِّبُونَ إِلَى اللَّهِ زُلْفَى Surah Zumar verse 3, We only worship them in order that they, the idols, bring us closer to Allah. The ultimate object of their worship was Allah. The ultimate object of their worship was Allah. But they would go through intermediaries to please Allah. So they believed in Allah. They believed in Allah, they believed that He was the Rabb. Yet they opposed the Prophet ﷺ. They tried to kill him. They fought against him. And many of them died in their shirk. If the meaning of La ilaha illallah was that there is no Rabb except Allah, why did they reject Islam? This is what they believed as the Quran says. This shows you that the meaning of the kalima is not just there is no Lord, there is no creator, there is no God except Allah. There is something more than that. It is not sufficient to believe that Allah exists and He is our Lord. And this is very important. You will ask, does anybody deny this amongst the Muslims? Can any Muslim deny that the mushrikun for example, they say the mushrikun didn't believe in Allah. I respond, yes, amazingly. Many of the groups, in fact, all the groups that were influenced by philosophy, like we said, they denied this fact because they wanted to justify their acts of shirk. 
of going through saints and of going through other people, they want to justify this. So they said that the meaning of La ilaha illallah means that there is no creator except Allah. There is no God, there is no Lord except Allah. And they denied that the mushrikun even believed in Allah. And this is found in the writings to this day, the famous quote-unquote scholars that are calling to these type of deviancies. They openly write in their books that the mushrikun didn't believe in Allah. The Qur'an clearly states that they believed in Allah. They called out to Allah. They thought that Allah was the Supreme Lord, they would go through Him, they attributed everything to Him. And yet because they want to justify their shirk, they go against the Qur'an and Sunnah and they deny this fact. So it is very important that we go out of our way on a tangent to prove clearly. These are not dead groups, these are living groups. Groups that are very common, all of you know of them and their scholars. And yet they claim that the meaning of La ilaha illallah is that there is no Lord except Allah. So we have to prove beyond a shadow of a doubt that the mushrikun believe this. The mushrikun believe there is no Lord except Allah. And that wasn't sufficient for them to be considered Muslims. So now we then go back to the topic at hand. What is the meaning then of La ilaha illallah? The crux of this matter goes back to the meaning of ilah. There is no ilah except for Allah. Allah doesn't say there is no Rabb except for Allah. This is something most of mankind believe. Had the meaning of the kalima been La Rabba illallah, most of mankind believes this. But Allah has made the kalima La ilaha illallah. There is no ilah except for Allah. So we have to go back then to the meaning of ilah. This is the crux. This is the whole issue. Our whole concept, our whole topic revolves around the meaning of ilah. And this moves us on to the topic of uluhiya. We finish rububiyya. We've described it, we've talked about it, we've proved its evidences, and we've shown you that the majority of mankind believes in it. Even though they might not believe in it perfectly, the Christians, for example, believe in Rububiyyah, but their trinity, it flaws their Rububiyyah. But they believe in it overall. In general, they believe there is one supreme Lord and Creator and, and God. So then we move on to the concept of Uluhiyyah, Ilah. What is the meaning of Ilah? Ibn Abbas said, and Ibn Abbas, you know who he is, the cousin of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, one of the most knowledgeable companions, and the one whom all the other Sahaba would turn to for fatwa. Ibn Abbas said, an ilah is one whom everything turns to and whom everyone worships. An ilah is one whom everything turns to and whom everyone worships. Likewise, you go back to the lexicons and the classical uh, books of, of, of uh, the classical dictionaries of the Arabic language, you find the same meaning. You go to uh, Ar-Raghib al-Asfahani, he wrote a famous book called Mufradat al-Quran al-Karim, in which he, he took every word of the Quran and he gave its proper classical meaning in the Arabic language. Every word in the Quran. And this book is famous because it's one of the earliest books written. Ar-Raghib al-Asfahani died 425 Hijri. In this book, you look up Ilah and he says, Ilah is a name given to every object that is worshipped. This is an ilah. Ilah is a name given to every object that is worshipped. Likewise, you go to Lisan al-Arab of Ibn Manzur, the other famous book, and he writes, any object that is taken as an object of worship is an ilah. Same thing, same as Ibn Abbas. All of the classical Arabic scholars of the language, they understand ilah to mean an object that is worshipped, an object that is venerated, an object that is shown these devotions. This is an ilah. And this is the meaning of the kalima. It is not there is no Rabb except Allah, there is no Creator except Allah, there is no God. A God is a vague, the word God is vague, imprecise. It could mean there is no Rabb except Allah. This is not correct. The meaning of the kalima, La ilaha illallah, there is no ilah, meaning object of worship besides Allah. Nothing deserves our worship. Nothing deserves our veneration, our love, our fear, our dua, our hope, our sacrifice, our salah, except for Allah. And this is why the mushrikun disbelieved. This is where they drew the line. This is why they fought the Prophet ﷺ, refused to say La ilaha illallah until their deathbeds. Because they could not give up the worship of other than Allah. Not that they didn't believe in Allah. They believed in Allah, as the Quran and Sunnah clearly says. Anyone who denies this is an ignorant person who doesn't know the Quran and Sunnah. Or he is an arrogant one denying the meanings of the Quran and Sunnah. No one with a clear heart can deny this. Go back to the Qur'an and Sunnah, look up Rububiyyah, look up the Mushrikun and they believed in it, and then look up Ilah, and what is the meaning of Ilah? 
There is no object that is worthy of worship except Allah. The mushrikun did not reject Allah. They did not reject Him as the Creator. Rather, they rejected worshipping Allah alone. They didn't even reject the worship of Allah. They would worship Allah. Sometimes. Sometimes, occasionally, they would turn to Allah directly. It is not that they rejected that we will not worship Allah. As Allah says in the Quran, concerning the mushrikun, فَإِذَا رَكِبُوا فِي الْفُلْكِ دَعَوَ اللَّهَ مُخْلِصِينَ لَهُ الدِّينَ When they, the mushrikun, would ride in the ocean, and the waves would come, they call out to Allah sincerely, forgetting their idols. And when they go back to land, they commit shirk. So the mushrikun used to worship Allah directly, but occasionally. And this was why they rejected La ilaha illallah. The mushrikun understood the meaning of the kalima, and that is why they rejected it. It is so sad that many Muslims today don't understand the meaning of the kalima, and claim to follow it, and yet fall into the same acts of shirk that the mushrikun of old did. The mushrikun were smarter than those who commit shirk of the Muslims of our times. Because they understood the meaning of La ilaha illallah. And that is why they rejected it. They understood that if they said La ilaha illallah, they could not go to the graves, they could not go to their idols, they could not go to rocks and stones, they could not make their dua, the sacrifice to other than Allah, therefore they rejected it. Is it not sad that many Muslims of our times are going to these graves, going to saints, showing their devotion to other than Allah, showing their worship to other than Allah, and they claim that they are followers of La ilaha illallah, because they have not understood the meaning of this beautiful kalima. There is no object that is worthy of worship except Allah. And that is why the Qur'an uses rububiyyah as a natural stepping stone to uluhiyyah. The Qur'an uses rububiyyah as a natural stepping stone to rububiyyah. Ya ayyuha nas U'budu rabbakum alladhi khalaqakum wa alladhi qablikum la'alakum tattaqoon. O mankind, worship your Rabb who created you and created those before you. Every one of mankind agrees God created us and created those before us. Yet very few only worship Him. It is illogical. It doesn't make sense. When you acknowledge that Allah is the Rabb, why do you turn to other than Him? When you acknowledge Allah created you, Allah gave you all that you have, what gives you the right to turn to other than Him? The Christians say, God Almighty created us. Why do you turn to Jesus Christ? The other religions, they say, the Supreme God created everything. Why do you turn to other than Him? The same excuse of the mushrikun. We are trying to come closer to Allah through them, and this is the shirk that they do. So this is the meaning of the kalima. And the summary of, the, of this section is that the Jahiliya Arabs fully believed in the rububiyyah of Allah. Yet the Prophet ﷺ fought them and consider them to be kuffar. They themselves rejected the kalima. They themselves rejected Islam because they realized that Islam is more than rububiyyah. They realized that it is uluhiyyah. And that is why the Quran says, as Allah says in the Quran, إِنَّهُمْ كَانُوا إِذَا قِيلَ لَهُمْ لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا اللَّهِ يَسْتَكْبِرُونَ These same mushrikun that Allah has described as believing in Him, when they were told, لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا اللَّهِ they will become arrogant. In another verse, وَعَجِبُوا أَنْ جَاءَهُمْ مُنْذِرٌ مِّنْهُمْ وَقَالَ الْكَافِرُونَ هَذَا سَاحِرٌ كَذَّابٌ They were amazed that a person came, a warner came amongst them, and the kafirun said he is a magician, a liar. أَجَعَلَ الْآلِهَةَ إِلَهًا وَاحِدًا إِنَّ هَذَا لَشَيْءٌ عُجَابٌ Has he made our objects of worship, ilah, into one? They didn't challenge Rububiyya. Has he made Allah? Has he called to Allah? No. Look at what they are challenging. They are not saying, is he calling us to Allah? They believed in Allah. Has he made our objects of worship into one? أَجَعَلَ الْآلِهَةَ إِلَهًا وَاحِدًا إِنَّ هَذَا لَشَيْءٌ عُجَابٌ This is an amazing thing. Preposterous. How can there only be one object worthy of worship? So Allah challenges them in many verses in the Qur'an. Literally dozens if not hundreds of verses. Allah challenges them. When you believe in Allah, some of them we quoted before. You acknowledge that Allah is your creator. فَأَنَّا تُؤْفَكُونَ أَفَلَا تَذَكَّرُونَ why do you not think? How do you, are you deluded? How are you misguided? Uluhiyyah is a natural consequence of rububiyyah. Yet very few people make that jump or leap. Rububiyyah, majority of mankind believes in it. Common sense follows from it that if Allah is the one who created you and gave you everything, why do you worship other than Him? This is the leap that most of mankind don't take and this is the leap where La ilaha illallah takes us. As Shaykh Rasulullah ibn Taymiyyah says in one of his passages, he writes, the majority of mankind believe in one Rabb. It is not that they deny this. What they deny is that only He deserves to be worshipped. 
And that is what the kalima takes us to. Let us return to the kalima and examine it a little bit more in detail, linguistically. The kalima, as we know, La ilaha illallah, four words. La ilaha illallah. There is no ilah except for Allah. Now the negation, the, the kalima is, is uh, composed of a negation and an affirmation. La ilaha is a negation. You have negated everything. And then there's an affirmation, illallah, except for Allah. And when you combine negation and affirmation, this is the height of eloquence. If I say, for example, that there is no one that is intelligent, this is a negation. You are not praising. If I say, Muhammad is intelligent sitting here, or Ahmed over here is intelligent, this is an affirmation. I have praised. But the height of eloquence come when I combine the two. And I say there is no one that is intelligent except Ahmed. Now I have praised Ahmed. Unlike in the other two ways. When you combine negation and affirmation, you come to the height of praise, the height of eloquence. <laughs> and this is what the shahada does. There is no object that I will turn to for help, direct my prayers to, my dua to, my worship to. There is nothing. You have negated everything. Whether it be a rock or a tree or a saint or a prophet or an angel, anything. And then you have affirmed only one. Illallah. Except for Allah. So the kalima is composed of a negation and an affirmation. The negation, you negate everything that is, that every object, any object, nothing is worthy of our worship. And then you affirm only one, Allah. Also linguistically, la, the first word la is a negation. We call it in Arabic, uh, yeah, the, the, the negation of la. It is required by Arabic uh, grammar that it have a description and a, an object to that description. Okay, let me explain. If you say, for example, لا رجل موجود في الدار There is no person that is uh, inside the house. So person is the subject of لا. There is no person. What is the description that is inside or that is present in the house? His, this is the description. So every لا of this nature that is a negating لا, it has a subject and the description of that subject. Okay, simple gr 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 grammatical fact that we need to, to, to realize before we move on to the next step. That every la which is a negation must have an ism and a khabar we call it. An obd or, or a, a, a noun or some type of subject and a description of that subject. As we, as we gave the example, لا رجل موجود في الدار There is no man that is presently available or there is no man that is inside the house. So the man is the subject, what is being negated. And the, the description that is inside, that is inside, mawjood. When we go to the kalima, we find that the ism is mentioned, but the khabar is not mentioned. We find that the subject, ilah, is mentioned, but the description is not mentioned. La ilaha, what? La ilaha, existence? La ilaha, what is the description of that ilah? This is not mentioned. So we have to then go back to the Qur'an and find out what is the missing description. And the missing description is worthy of worship. Because if you were to translate the kalima literally, it comes out, there is no ilah except for Allah. There is no ilah what? In existence? If that were the case, this is not true. There are many ilahs in existence besides Allah. Can someone give me an example? Okay, that's one example. Another example, more apparent. Even more apparent example. Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ. Is he an ilah linguistically? We're not talking about shari wise. Linguistically. Yes, he is an ilah to the Christians. You understand? Buddha, is he an ilah? Linguistically. Obviously, shari, this is a, linguistically. What is the meaning of ilah? One who is worshipped. Go back to the definitions. Anything that is worshipped is an ilah. So had the meaning of the khabar or the, the description been there is no ilah in existence except for Allah, this is incorrect. There are millions of ilahs in existence. Millions of objects that are worshipped besides Allah. The correct understanding and the correct description is worthy 
of worship. There is no ilah that deserves to be an ilah. In Arabic we say, لا إله بحق إلا الله. There is no object, there is no ilah that is worthy of being an ilah except for Allah. This is profound, the meaning of this. Why? Because some groups, the extreme Sufi groups, those groups that claim that Allah exists in us and we exist in Allah. This is called in Arabic, وَحْدَةِ wujud, right? That the existence is all a part of Allah. They understand the kalima in the incorrect way. And they say, there is no ilah in existence except for Allah. Which then implies that any object that is worshipped is Allah. Therefore we have Ibn Arabi, their most famous uh, yani, uh, proponent of their faith. He writes clearly, A'udhu Billah min al-Kufr. He writes, it doesn't matter if I do sajda to a dog or to a tree. This is what he writes in his poem. Al-Futuhat al-Makki and other, and other works that he has. There is no difference if I do sajda to the dog or to the tree. Everything is but a manifestation of thee, of you. This is what he writes because he believes in this type of kalima. La ilaha mawjood illallah. Everything in existence basically is Allah. Another incorrect understanding is that of the Mu'tazila and the Ashairah and the majority of uh, yani the groups that have been affected by philosophy, uh, philosophers and they understand the kalima as being there is no Rabb except for Allah. So they say that there is no Rabb in existence except for Allah. La Rabb, that is how they understand the kalima. Therefore when these people turn to their saints or they turn to their other created objects or they turn to graves and they give their sacrifice and devotion to them you say you're doing shirk, you're going against the kalima. They say, no we're not. We believe that there is no Rabb except for Allah. In existence except for Allah. So they have misinterpreted the, the ilah, the meaning of ilah. So there are two main misinterpretations of the kalima. In fact, there's many more, but for, for this basic level course, we'll just talk about the two ones. The first one is the misunderstanding of ilah. This is the first incorrect understanding. And this is practiced by, or this a misunderstanding is... Uh, expounded by the majority of groups affected by philosophy, the Mu'tazila, the Ashairah, and most of the uh, moderate Sufis if you like. They understand the kalima to mean there is no Rabb in existence except for Allah. And because of this they justify their acts of shirk. The second misunderstanding of the kalima is by the extreme, the radical Sufis who believe that everything is a manifestation of Allah. They understand ilah correctly. They don't, their misunderstanding is not in ilah. Their misunderstanding comes in the khabar or in the description that is missing, that is not apparent in the kalima. And they say there is no ilah in existence except for Allah. Therefore, the entire existence to them becomes Allah. The correct understanding is to understand ilah and to understand the missing khabar correctly. There is no ilah worthy of being an ilah except for Allah. If you want to translate the kalima into standard English, there is no object or deity that is worthy of worship except for Allah. Worthy, this is the missing description. The word worthy is not found in the kalima. La ilaha illallah. There is no ilah except for Allah. But there is no ilah what? Missing, there is no ilah present. There is no ilah on the face of this earth. There is no ilah worthy. This is the correct and the missing khabar. There is no ilah worthy of being an ilah except for Allah. There is no object, there is no deity worthy of being worshipped except for Allah. This is the meaning of the kalima. And this is why the mushrikun rejected it. And this is why the majority of mankind as well rejects this kalima. With this we'll take a short break inshallah and then continue with uh, the third session. Bismillah. Alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah, wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa man wala. We have discussed Tawheed al-Rububiyyah and the proofs and, its, and the evidences of Tawheed al-Rububiyyah. And we have proven that the Mushrikun and the Jahiliya Arabs believed in it and yet they were not Muslims. So we have shown through this way and through other ways that this is not the meaning of the Kalima. That there is no Rabb and there is no God and there is no Lord except for Allah. Rather the meaning of ilah we have said is an object that is worshipped. And we have also shown that the proper understanding of the kalima is there is no object that is worthy of worship except for Allah Azza wa Jal. And this is what Tawheed al-Uluhiyya is. Tawheed al-Uluhiyya means 
that nothing will be worshipped except for Allah. Or in another phrase if you like, it is Tawheed of one's actions in relation to the Creator. How is Tawheed al-Rububiyya defined? Tawheed of the actions of Allah. Whatever Allah Azza wa does, He is the only one that does it in a unique way. No one can be like Him. Tawheed al-Uluhiyya means our actions, our ibadah, our salah, our zakah, our love and fear and hope will be unified to Allah Azza wa Jal. So Tawheed al-Uluhiyya is the unification of the servant's actions for Allah. And Tawheed al rubiyah is the unification of the actions of Allah Azza wa Himself. So this is one way to define Tawheed al uluhiyyah Or we said that, that nothing is worshipped except for Allah. So this is Uluhiyyah. And this is the meaning of the kalima. However, is it sufficient for someone just to say La ilaha illallah and that's it? If you go to a kafir and you say repeat after me La ilaha illallah and he repeats after you Does that make him a Muslim? Of course not. Rather he must, there are certain conditions that must be met. And this is our next topic. What are the conditions of La ilaha illallah? What are the conditions which, which make this kalima acceptable? Al-Hasan al-Basri was asked it is said that people, that whoever says La ilaha illallah will enter Jannah. He replied, whoever says La ilaha illallah and fulfills its rights and obligations, he will enter Jannah. Not just repeating the phrase like a parrot. Likewise, Wahab ibn Munabbih, another famous scholar, both Wahab and, and Hassan died in the year 110 Hijri. And both were famous scholars of the Tabi'un. Wahab ibn, ibn Munabbih was asked, is not La ilaha illallah the key to Jannah? He said, yes. But every key has ridges, every key has those lines. And only if you come with the key with the proper ridges will the lock open. You cannot just take any key and open the, any door with it. You must come with the proper key, the right ridges. In other words, the conditions of La ilaha illallah. So what are these conditions? When we turn to the Quran and Sunnah, the scholars have derived seven necessary conditions in order for this kalima to be acceptable. Now some of these conditions are overlapping in that they share a little bit with another one but put together they form the complete picture. And each of these conditions has an opposite to it which negates that condition. So we will discuss the seven conditions of La ilaha illallah and the opposite or the negating factors of each of these conditions. The first condition is knowledge. What is the meaning of La ilaha illallah? And we've already discussed the proper meaning. And the opposite of knowledge is ignorance. You don't know the meaning of La ilaha illallah. So in order for La ilaha illallah to be acceptable, you must understand what it means. If you merely parrot it, if you merely repeat it after someone without knowing what it means, with ignorance, this will not benefit you. As Allah says, فَعْلَمْ أَنَّهُ لَا إِلَهِ اللَّهِ No! La ilaha illallah. Likewise, the Prophet ﷺ said, مَنْ مَاتَ وَهُوَ يَعْلَمُ أَنْ لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا اللَّهِ دَخَلَ الْجَنَّةِ Whoever dies while he knows La ilaha illallah, not just repeating, he knows the meaning of La ilaha illallah. This one will enter Jannah, this person will enter Jannah. The first condition. The second condition is certainty, that it is true. Yaqeen in Arabic we call it. And the opposite of certainty is doubt. You must be certain, not just to know the meaning of La ilaha illallah. You must be certain that there is no object that is worthy of worship except for Allah. Yaqeen. If you have any doubt about this, then your La ilaha illallah is not acceptable. As Allah Azza wa Jal says, إِنَّمَا الْمُؤْمِنُونَ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا بِاللَّهِ وَرَسُولِهِ ثُمَّ لَمْ يَرْتَابُوا The mu'mins are those who believe in Allah and His Messenger and then have no doubts regarding that. No doubts. In one hadith, the Prophet sallallahu said, "Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wa anni rasulullah." He said the kalimatain, and then he said, "Nobody meets Allah with these kalima, having no doubt about them, غير شاك فيهما, except that he will enter Jannah. Not just that he believes in it; he must have no doubt about it. Yaqeen. If anyone thinks that there is another object that is worthy of worship besides Allah, even if he does not worship that object." He is not a Muslim. A person who says, yes, it's alright for the Christians to worship Jesus Christ. I don't worship Him, but it's okay for them to worship Him. A person who says that anyone who worships other than Allah, he might enter Jannah. This person is not a Muslim. Call him what you will, he is not a Muslim. Because he has rejected La ilaha illallah. He has allowed, even though he didn't do it, he has allowed the possibility 
of an object being worshipped besides Allah and he has stated that it is acceptable. So the second condition is that of yaqeen. The third condition is that of qabul or accepting this. Not only must you know it and be certain about it, but then accept it with your heart and soul. Qabul. And the opposite of acceptance is rejectance. You reject it. As Allah describes the disbelievers, إِنَّهُمْ كَانُوا إِذَا قِيلَ لَهُمْ لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا اللَّهِ يَسْتَكْبِرُونَ They would, when they were said, لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا اللَّهِ They would become arrogant. They would not accept it, they would reject it. And this is a necessary condition of لا إله إلا الله. The fourth condition is to submit to it physically. Not just to theoretically believe in it. To submit your heart and soul, your body, your actions to this kalima. This is called in Arabic inqiyad. And the opposite is to leave it and not act upon it. So لا إله إلا الله cannot remain theoretical. It must be made tangible, practical in one's actions. And the proof for this is many of them is, as Allah says, وَأَنِيبُوا إِلَىٰ رَبِّكُمْ وَأَسْلِمُوا لَهُ Turn to your lords and submit yourself to Him. Not just theoretically, in your body and in your soul, both. Likewise, وَاتَّبِعُوا أَحْسَنَ مَا أُنزِلِ إِلَيْكُمْ مِنْ رَبِّكُمْ Follow, follow by actions that which has been revealed to you from your Lord. It must be put into action. It is not sufficient merely to believe theoretically. And this is the case with many, many of the intellectuals of the non-Muslims. So many of them who are open and sincere, they come to the conclusion, yes, Islam is the truth. La ilaha illallah is true. But they don't accept. They don't practice. These people, they are not Muslims. Abu Talib believed in the Prophet wasallam. He believed in la ilaha illallah. But he refused to say it. He refused to implement it. Therefore, he died a non-Muslim. Theoretical belief is not enough. It must be put into practice and action. The fifth condition of La ilaha illallah is being truthful to it and not lying about it. Being truthful to this kalima, Sidq. You must be truthful to it. And this negates the hypocrites who claim to be believers and outwardly claim to do the actions, but in their hearts they are not truthful, they are not sadiqeen. As Allah Azza wa says, وَمَيْنَ النَّاسِ مَنْ يَقُولُ آمَنَّا بِاللَّهِ وَبَلْيَهُمُ الْآخِرِ وَمَا هُمْ بِمُؤْمِنِينَ There are those amongst mankind who believe, who claim that they believe. They say that they believe in Allah and in the Day of Judgment, but they are not believers. They try to deceive Allah and Allah is the one deceiving them. And in one hadith the Prophet ﷺ said, there is no one who testifies La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah Sidqan min qalbihi Truly, sincerely from his heart Truthfully from his heart Sidq Except that he will enter Jannah And Allah will make the nar or the fire of hell haram upon him So the fifth condition is one must be truthful And not be lying when he says this kalima The sixth condition is not only must he be truthful But he must do so for the sake of Allah Azza wa Jal Meaning ikhlas, sincerity not for the sake of the dunya, not for the sake of the world, not for the sake of impressing anyone or becoming a part of an Islamic state. At times the Islamic state becomes powerful and glorious. So it is to one's political advantage, monetary advantage, to claim allegiance to Islam. And this was the case during the time of the Prophet ﷺ, when the Prophet ﷺ passed away and during the time of the Khulafa al-Rashidun. That it was advantageous dunya-wise to be a Muslim. Therefore the hypocrites increased in number. In the Meccan stage, there were no hypocrites. Why? Because it's not good to be a Muslim, monetary-wise. Right? You lose your dunya, you're persecuted. But when it became good to be a Muslim, money-wise, politically, socially, then they had a lot of people pretending to be Muslim. So the sixth condition is that you must say this kalima sincerely for the sake of Allah. Ikhlas, sincerity, without any shirk. Not like the munafiqoon or the mushrikun. As Allah says, Verily, to Allah belongs the religion alone. And the Prophet ﷺ said, The one who will obtain my shafa'a, who has the most chances of obtaining my shafa'a, is the one who says, La ilaha illallah, khalisan min qalbi. Sincerely from his heart. There must be sincerity, ikhlas. If there is no ikhlas, if you, do, if you say the kalima for other than Allah, it will not be accepted. 
This is the sixth of the seventh conditions. And the seventh condition is that you must love this kalima and love the people of this kalima and hate those who reject this kalima and hate all objects that are worshipped besides Allah if they are calling to that worship. You must hate the false worship of other than Allah and hate the people who deny La ilaha illallah. This is a part of our iman. This is a part of the kalima. How can you love someone who worships other than Allah? We're talking about a spiritual love. Love is of many types. We'll talk about it inshallah at a later date. We're talking about a spiritual. We're not talking about a natural love. If a person accepts Islam and his mother and father are not Muslim, there will be a natural love that he has. But we're talking about the spiritual brotherhood of Islam and Iman, the Ukhuwa. This spiritual bond must only be to the Muslims. And it must be stronger than the natural bond. The strongest bond is the bond of Iman, the bond of La ilaha illallah. Those who oppose La ilaha illallah, you cannot love them, the spiritual love. You cannot respect them. Rather, those who claim this, they are rejecting La ilaha illallah. Anyone who claims that another religion or another uh, group who worships other than Allah will enter Jannah, or they are our brothers in faith, or we are all a part of the same faith, they have in fact rejected La ilaha illallah. Whether they like it or not, they might verbalize it, but by rejecting this condition, because they have allowed, for example, those who worship Jesus Christ to enter Jannah. How can those who worship Jesus Christ enter Jannah when, when, when Allah says La ilaha illallah? It goes against La ilaha illallah. They have allowed those who worship other than Allah to enter Jannah, so they have loved the people who oppose La ilaha illallah, and by that they have rejected La ilaha illallah even if they verbalize it. This is the seventh condition. You must love it, the La ilaha illallah, the kalima, and you must love the people of La ilaha illallah. And the follow-up of that is you must hate all that opposes it. As Allah Azza wa says, لا تجد قوم يؤمنون بالله واليوم الآخر يوادون من حاد الله ورسوله ولو كانوا آباءهم أو أبناءهم أو إخوانهم أو عشيرتهم. You will not find a group of people who believe in Allah in the last day loving those who oppose Allah and His Messenger. This is a verse in the Quran. Even if they are their fathers or their sons or their tribesmen, tribesmen. It is not possible. We're talking about the spiritual love, remember, which is the strongest form of love. There might be a natural love that a person naturally feels for his parents, or for, for example. But that love will be subservient to and less than the primary love of Islam. So if there is a clash, then the love of Islam automatically takes precedence over the natural love. And that is why the Muslims would fight their own brothers and kill their own fathers in the battles of, of Uhud and the Badr and whatnot. Because the love of Islam, here is a person trying to kill the Messenger of Allah, opposing La ilaha illallah. Even if he's my brother or my father, I will go and kill him. This is the seventh condition that the love of La ilaha illallah must be there. And the love of those who say La ilaha illallah must also be there. And this is the primary love. All other loves must be subservient to that. And anyone who opposes La ilaha illallah cannot have that spiritual love, that brotherhood. Now obviously this doesn't mean that you show hatred to those who, you know, the, the, the non-Muslims here. No, this doesn't mean this. We are talking about the spiritual bond of brotherhood doesn't include them. Allah tells us in the Quran to treat the non-Muslims who do not fight us nicely. He tells us to treat them with respect, to treat, not with respect, but with bir, which means you treat them in a good way. Which means that you are just with them. You do not cheat them, you do not lie to them, you show good akhlaq to them. But the purpose should be to guide them to Islam. That is why you do it. This doesn't mean that you take them as brothers or as, you know, uh, as friends besides the believers. No. Our ultimate allegiance is to Allah and His Messenger and those who believe in Allah and His Messenger. As for those who oppose Allah and His Messenger, then if their opposition is apparent and their hatred is clear, we must oppose them in a similar way. But if they are not accepting La ilaha Allah, but they are leaving us to our deen, as is the case in most Western countries, then in this case Allah commands us that we respect the treaties we have with them, we respect the laws that we have with them, we do not take them as our brothers or our, our, our bosom friends if you like, but we treat with them justly and kindly, but that doesn't negate the fact that they have rejected La ilaha illallah and unless they accept it, they will not enter Jannah. Okay, so this is the seventh and the final condition of La ilaha illallah. 
Okay, who can summarize these seven conditions? Who can state them again? The first one? Knowledge. The second one? Certainty. The third one? Acceptance. The fourth one? Submitting to it. The fifth one? Being truthful to it. The sixth one? Ikhlas, sincerity. And the final one? Mahabba, love for it and for its people. These are the seven conditions of La ilaha illallah. Of course, there is an implicit condition as well, and that is that uh, one must follow these seven conditions until he dies. It's, it's understood. If you reject any of these conditions before your death, then uh, obviously you have rejected La ilaha illallah. What counts is a person's iman at the time of his death, and not if he was a mu'min and then he a Muslim and then he rejected Islam. It doesn't matter. So there's an implicit condition as well. So some scholars have said eight conditions, but it's implied. I don't see the need to say an eighth condition that you die upon. It's understood that a person must follow these seven conditions until he dies. So these are the seven conditions of La ilaha illallah. If a person says it with these conditions, then and only then will he obtain the rewards of it. And if he says it not having these conditions, then he will not obtain the rewards. Now there are levels of each of these conditions. There's, there are levels, for example, of inqiyad, of ikhlas, of mahabba. And this is how a person increases in his allegiance to La ilaha illallah. Remember we said La ilaha illallah brings a person into Iman and it also takes him to the heights of Iman. Remember we said this, this is the, the, middle, the, the middle rope that you climb up. This is the ladder that you go. How do you climb up it? By these seven conditions and perfecting them. There must be a bare minimum of all seven. And that is the obligatory amount. As you perfect each of these seven more and more and more, you climb higher and higher to your allegiance to La ilaha illallah. The more you submit your soul, the more you love Allah and His Messenger, the more you have ikhlas, the more you have acceptance, so on and so forth, you rise in your iman and allegiance to La ilaha illallah. And the less you have it, the lesser is your iman. And we said there is a bare minimum of each one of these things. If you go even below this by showing any of these two other than Allah, then your La ilaha illallah will be rejected from you even if you verbalize it. What was the source of Ibn Arabi's poem? If I'm not mistaken, it is Futuhat Makiya. Uh, but there could be the other book, Fusus al-Hikam as well. There are two books of his that are the most extreme in his kufr. Fusus al-Hikam, Pearls of Wisdom, and Futuhat Makiya. These are his two main books. I don't advise anybody to read them. Burn them if you have them. But uh, these are his books if, uh, for, for knowledge sake, someone asked. Okay, uh, a person asks, can you give the references of the ayat? Inshallah from tomorrow, then bi'ithnillah, I will try to start giving the references so that we can go back to them. Um, but I have quoted all of them in Arabic. So, uh, you know, worst comes to worst, you can look it up yourself or ask someone who knows where to look it up, to look it up. Okay, this is a more philosophical question. <laughs> what is the difference between the self, the identity, and the fitrah? Uh, in reality, these are vague terminologies, the self and the identity. Th these are terms that are used by secular science, sciences and psychologists and whatnot. And we have to always, uh, before we discuss anything, define what is being discussed. So it depends on how you define the self and how you define the identity. And in reality, it is always best to use the Islamic uh, ter terminologies and definitions. In Islam, we have the body and we have the soul. Very simple. The ruh and the jasad. And we have, for example, the fitrah and other things. This is, these are Islamic terms, very simple to understand. As for these psychological terms or these philosophical terms, then uh, these are something that we have to first ask them to define for us. After they've defined it, then we can uh, present the correct opinion on it. Uh, how does one know if he really believes uh, in Allah Azza wa Jal? Obviously by implementing Islam. I mean, it's something if you believe in Allah and you act upon it, this is something, uh, it is clear cut. If you, you ask yourself, everyone knows what he knows. <laughs> this is a part of knowledge. Uh, you might want to ask, how, does, how do you know if you have Iman? This is probably a more appropriate question. You look at how much you are implementing Allah's commandments. This is how you know your Iman. Iman is proportional to the efforts that you are showing. Your prayer, your salah, your zakah, your taqwa, your khushu'ah, your, your fearing of Allah, your avoiding sins. This is a manifestation of your iman. The closer and the better you are, the stronger your iman is. What is the difference between shirk and bid'ah, shirk and innovation? An innovation is an act which has been introduced into the religion and was not present in it. So something which is introduced into the religion, this is a bid'ah. 
Shirk is to direct an act of worship to other than Allah. Or if you like a better definition, and we will just discuss shirk in, in, in great detail inshallah uh, tomorrow inshallah. Uh, shirk is to give the rights of Allah to other than Allah. This is shirk, definition of shirk. So bid'ah is to innovate something to the religion. A bid'ah could be shirk, it could be kufr, it could be uh, less than that. So if someone innovates grave worship, this is a bid'ah because it's, no, the Prophet and the, and the Sahaba did not do grave worship billah, from that. It's an innovation, but it's also shirk. Because they are not going to the grave and, and prostrating to them or sacrificing to them or, or making dua to them. This is shirk. And it's also a bid'ah. Uh, for example, uh, a bid'ah uh, is for example the, the celebrating the Prophet's birthday, milad. This is a bid'ah which is not necessarily shirk. If it's just done without calling out to the Prophet and you just gather together and celebrate and you chant and you do this and that. This was not done by the Prophet nor was it done by the companions, nor was it done by any of the uh, pious khulafa after him, even with the Umayyads and the Abbasids for many, many hundreds of years. It was introduced in the 4th century of the Hijrah. We might discuss this in a future session. But this is an innovation, bid'ah. Okay? So this is a bid'ah which is not shirk. If it's done, with, it's, it's, it's possible there could be shirk involved if you call out to the Prophet ﷺ, but if there is no calling out, it is a, a bid'ah. So every act of shirk which is done by Muslims must be a bid'ah, must have been introduced. But not every bid'ah is an act of shirk. Uh, the question is, why is the uh, description of worthy of worship not clarified in it? This is because it is understood very clearly. If you understand the meaning of ilah, which is why we went into detail in ilah, proving the meaning of ilah and that is not rab, you understand ilah means an object of worship, that is understood that what is the missing description is very clear, it's common sense. There are millions of objects that are worshipped, but there is only one that is worshipped and deserves to be worshipped. It is not, uh, this is not, uh, I mean the majority of, of, of Muslims who understand ilah properly, the meaning of ilah properly, they understand this description properly. The main problem is that they don't understand the meaning of ilah. And this is the main problem. Those who claim that everything is Allah, Allah is everything, they are minority amongst Muslims. Very small minority. But those who worship other than Allah or do some type of, of, of uh, innovations with regards to their shaykhs and, and showing exaltation to them, they are many because they have not understood the meaning of ilah, which means an object of worship. If you do not fulfill all the seven conditions of the kalima, would this take you out of the fold of Islam? Like we said, we explained this in detail, is that there is a bare minimum of, of each of these seven. Now remember, what is required is not that you memorize these seven conditions, but you implement them. The average Muslim who is practicing Islam properly, he doesn't know these seven conditions. He cannot list them. But look now, is he, is he implementing them? Yes, of course he is. This is what is required. It is not required that you memorize them and you, and you know the evidence. If you do, alhamdulillah, very good. But the average Muslim doesn't know these seven conditions by heart. Yet, inshallah, he is implementing them. He does have ikhlas, he does have love, he does have uh, the qabul, he does have the acceptance, all of this is there. So what is required is you actually do it and not necessarily that you memorize it. And we said there is a bare minimum of, of each of these seven. When it is done to other than Allah, this takes you out of la ilaha illallah. But if it is not perfection, like for example, all of us commit sins. This is a weakness of our submission, isn't it? A weakness. But we realize that we are committing sins. So it is a weakness and it doesn't take us out of La ilaha illallah. It is not that if a person commits a sin, he becomes a kafir. A'udhu billah. This is the extreme opinion of the khawarij. This is not the opinion of, of Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah. Rather, we state that when a person realizes he's committing a sin and he knows it, but as long as his worship is to Allah, this is a weakness of his kalima, but not taking him outside the fold of it. But if he now worships other than Allah, then it doesn't matter. His la ilaha illallah is gone to waste. Okay, this is a question about the the hadith I quoted of the nine, 99 scrolls and the one bitaqa or the one uh, card. And they're asking that how can you understand this hadith when we know that the Prophet said that a man who doesn't pray will be with Fir'aun and Haman and others. And how can he have fulfilled the conditions of La ilaha illallah? This is a very uh, good question. Realize that this incident of the 99 is a solitary incident. Every Muslim will have La ilaha illallah, but it will not happen to all of them, will it? 
The Prophet said, one man of my ummah will be brought forth and this will happen to him. So the general rule is that a person who does not have any more deeds has not fulfilled la ilaha illallah. But perhaps there will be some exception in history. For example, the man maybe just accepted Islam and died or some exception, some exceptional scenario occurred where that la ilaha illallah was his only good deed. Likewise, the man of the children of Israel who, who did a lot of sins and then he uh, died upon Tawheed, la ilaha illallah. The point is that this is not the general rule. The general rule is that to fulfill la ilaha illallah, you must put it, show it in your salah, in your fasting, in your zakah. All of this is a fulfillment of la ilaha illallah. Now there are exceptional cases, as the hadith of the Prophet in one hadith in Sahih Muslim, he said the last group of people will be a group of people who have never done any good deed, except of course la ilaha illallah. Never done any good deed. This is the exception. This is the final batch to be taken out of the fire of hell. From the time of Adam until the day of judgment, there will be for sure some scenarios, some cases, some people who maybe they accepted Islam, but for whatever reason they didn't implement it. Allah knows their situation and circumstance. So this is the exception that cannot be used to redefine the rule. The rule as is shown throughout the Quran and in the Sunnah is that Islam must be implemented with good deeds. Iman consists of Statements of the heart, belief in uh, belief of the heart, statements of the tongue, and actions as we know. Iman must be shown in one's actions. Now those people who try to deny this rule, which is mentioned in hundreds of verses, in the ladina amanu wa aminu salihat, as Allah always says, Iman and Amanu Salih together. Hundreds of verses. This is the rule. Likewise, the Quran and Sunnah, as the, the, the brother or sister quoted the hadith, he who does not pray will be resurrected with Fir'aun and Qarun and Haman. If he leaves just the prayer, he's going to be resurrected to the Fir'aun and, Harun and, uh, uh, Fir'aun and Haman and Qarun. Just the prayer. How about if he didn't do any good deed? So it is not correct to take one or two ahadith and ignore hundreds of ayat and ahadith and derive the rule from these ahadith. Rather, we look at the whole picture and we say the general rule is that Iman must consist of belief and statements and actions and it is a manifestation of La ilaha illallah that you practice it. But throughout the millions of years or hundreds of thousands of years of, of mankind, there might be one or two people or a few people, 0.0001% if you like, whatever the situation, who somehow they believed La ilaha illallah, they said it, but they didn't practice it the way that it should have been practiced. And these are the exceptions to the rule. And this is not the rule itself. And Allah Azza knows best. Are our human attributes created? Yes, the human attributes are created. Humans are created, so their attributes are created as well. It is only Allah Azza wa Jal whose names and attributes are uh, uncreated. And then the brother or sister asks that uh, the hadith that Allah has sent mercy down for us. Can you clarify this hadith? Yes, the hadith states that Allah Azza wa Jal has divided his mercy into 100 parts. Uh, 99, of them, uh, one, 99 of them will be used on the day of judgment and one of them will, was sent down to this earth and because of this the mother has mercy for her child and everyone else has mercy for everyone else even the animals have mercy from this one so basically if you take all the mercy ever shown throughout the history of the creation this only equals one one hundredth of the mercy that Allah will show on uh, the day of judgment uh, the meaning of this hadith is the effects of Allah's mercy Allah's mercy itself is infinite Allah's mercy is an attribute of Allah it cannot be uh, quantified. Just like all of Allah's names and attributes, what is, what, what is being referred to is the effects of Allah's mercy. Like we say, if you were to take all of the mercy shown, compassion shown throughout mankind's existence, it would only be one one hundredth of the mercy that is shown on the Day of Judgment. This doesn't mean that Allah's mercy will finish after the Day of Judgment. Of course not. So it, the mercy of Allah is infinite. It cannot be quantified. Rather, what is being referred to is the effects of that mercy. Okay, there's, this, there's a question about Tawheed al-Hakimiyyah. Uh, is this another type of, of Tawheed? Tawheed al-Hakimiyyah uh, has been defined to be the Tawheed that Allah Azza wa Jal is the only one who has the right to legislate. Who tells you what is allowed and what is prohibited? What is halal and what is haram? You can do this and you cannot do this. Only Allah Azza wa Jal. Now, those people who try to divide Tawheed into four categories, they in reality have not understood Tawheed al rububiyyah Go back to what I said. Tawheed al-Rububiyyah, one aspect of Tawheed al-Rububiyyah was what? Allah is the one who has the right to be obeyed. So there's no need to take out this and subcategorize into a fourth category. It comes under Rububiyyah. In al hukmu illa lillah, the judgment only belongs to Allah. We do not have the right to legislate 
as is the case in all other countries on the face of the earth, they legislate. To believe they have the right to legislate is a type of kufr. I will discuss this inshallah tomorrow as well. Because it goes against la ilaha illallah. Part of la ilaha illallah means what? That only Allah Azza wa has the right to tell you what is allowed and what is prohibited. But to say that there are four types of tawheed, this is going to an extreme and it was not done by the scholars of the past and it should be uh, avoided. Muslims are being blamed for creating hate against the non-believers. Please explain in light of the seventh condition. I believe I did explain it in that it depends on uh, the situation of the non-Muslim. If the non-Muslim is openly showing you enmity and fighting you, here there is no question of mercy. Every non-Muslim will even will agree. In this case, if someone's fighting you, you fight him back. If someone shows you oppression, you, you fight back to, to fight for your rights. As Allah Azza wa Jal Himself says. But if someone is not doing this to you, he's not preventing you from uh, worshipping Allah Azza wa Jal. He's allowing you to do this. And he's not showing his open enmity and discord. In this case, Allah says, لَا يَنْهَاكُمُ اللَّهُ عَنِ الَّذِينَ لَمْ يُقَاتِلُكُمْ فِي الدِّينِ وَلَمْ يُخْرِجُكُمْ مِنْ دِيَارِكُمْ أَنْ تَبَرُّوهُمْ وَتُخْصِتُوا لَهِمْ Ayah of the Quran. Allah has not prohibited you from those non-believers who did not fight you, nor did they kick you out, expel you from your homes, that you show just justness to them. And that you show equality. That equality meaning, يعني, you fulfill the covenant and the treaties that you have with them. So this is something that the Qur'an tells us to do, that for example, we are living in their countries, for example. Uh, we must respect the laws in as much as it doesn't interfere with our sharia. We are not allowed to, do, to harm them or to do things to them, as is being done unfortunately in many places in the world. This is not allowed to do. These are not the people that, uh, that we are allowed to do this with. It is not allowed to do this. Rather, Allah Azza wa Jalla clearly says, we have bir and we have tuhsinu ilayhim, that we show them the kindness and compassion of Islam so that they see the beauty of Islam and accept Islam because of that. What is prohibited by the seventh condition is to love them, the spiritual love. This is what is prohibited. I'm not saying, like I said, that you, when you look at them, you look at them in a mean way and you scowl at them and you say, oh, you this and that. This is not what Islam wants. The Prophet ﷺ would treat his non-Muslim neighbors and the other non-Muslims with such kindness and compassion. And it was that kindness that caused them to accept Islam. We're talking about the spiritual love that cannot exist for the non-Muslim. The bond of brotherhood. The realization that this person is a Muslim and he has rights over me. That cannot exist with someone who rejects La ilaha illallah. This is the meaning of uh, the seventh condition. Wa akhru da'wana alhamdulillah al-alameen. Wa sallallahu wa sallam wa barakatuh.